recently. They started creating runaway inflation. And now that's it. They have no, there's, there's no more games to be played because the next recession, depression, credit crisis, stock market debacle will be extremely deflationary for a while. And then on the wake of that will be inflation that'll just absolutely mind boggling. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with investment manager, Michael Pinto. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Michael, in which he argues why he expects the rest of 2021 to be defined not by inflation, but disinflation, followed by a deflationary bust in 2022, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that Michael and our partners at New Harbor Financial will share in this interview. Oh, and if you haven't yet, don't forget to subscribe to this channel by clicking the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes a second and it really helps us out. As the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts we can attract onto this program in the future. All right, and now here's part two of our interview with Michael Pento. Getting back to your question about, your point about, um, the, the, the fiscal and monetary stimulus that we've seen you predict is going to be a lot lower next year. Um, a lot. First question for you is, is, is why, why are you so confident in that prediction? In other words, why can't the Fed just say, yeah, you know what, we're just going to keep the spigots on? Why can't Congress just say, you know what, we're just going to pass another six trillion in stimulus? Um, well, what's going to prevent them from doing that? A crash. So there's no, right now people are saying, oh, you know, the uh, initial claims are falling. We have 500,000, 800,000 uh, initial jobs created every month. Um, still, we have, we still have 14 million Americans that are on some sort of, you know, correct. employment support. But, but yeah, go ahead. Correct. But, but, the, but the crisis, clearly, the crisis in their eyes is, is over. Uh, but the most, the most salient question, the salient response to that is, for the first time since 2008, and really for the first time since 1981, we actually have a huge problem with inflation. If you, inflation's a lagging indicator, so don't, don't just say, you know, well, you said you're hedged for disinflation. I'm talking about the data coming out now shows producer prices close to 10% year over year. I mean, that, that's, that's just an astronomical rate of inflation. If you look at um, PPI, uh, CPI up 6% year over year, that's three times higher than where the Fed was comfortable putting their inflation rate. So I think that's enough cause for the Fed to start at least pulling back on their monetary largesse. As a matter of fact, it's not just the Federal Reserve. Every central bank on the planet, other than the ECB, is either going to be tightening monetary policy or threatening to tighten monetary policy in 2022. But the most important reason, well, one of the other most important reason is that you have a very narrow uh, scope between uh, Republicans and Democrats in Washington, D.C. So that the, the Senate has only one seat to give up. And, and um, the gentleman from West Virginia um, is not going to go along with a massive multiple trillion dollar stimulus package. No chance. So his name is Mr. Joe Manchin. This is he Manchin, will right? not, yeah. He will not, he will never agree to passing a multiple trillion dollar stimulus package at this juncture. He probably will, along with all of the Republicans, after the stock market is down 50%. Okay, so, so he, sort of to be succinct, in your mind, do you feel that the politicians and the policymakers, they are gonna go big, but they want the air cover of the pain of a correcting market to be able to do that? There is no, I mean, the House has five seats to give up and the Senate has no seats to give up. It's such a close race right now that you're going to have to get every single Democrat and every single in, in both houses of, of uh, Congress to approve a multiple trillion dollar stimulus package, which there is no need. There's no empirical need for at this moment. They do it ex post. Both Republicans and Democrats do it ex post after the chaos arrives. So after the chaos arrives in 2022, I have no doubt you're going to get a multiple trillion dollar stimulus package passed. How fast they get it done, 
I don't know. It, you know, it, it's, you know. Remember the TARP plan? It, it was seven hundred. Remember seven hundred billion dollars failed. <laughs> when it used to sound big. <laughs> well now, well now we're talking about multiple, multiple trillion dollars, and there's ramifications to that with the bond market, which is already getting very was already getting very skittish not too long ago. Okay. All right. So, so, so question for you on that as you expound further here. Um, I'm just old enough to remember the term bond vigilantes, right? Where the bond market actually would call the bluff on yes. the government. Um, but we haven't seen them for decades now. So you, 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 basically you were talking the bond market might revolt. I, I think that's sort of a modern version of the vigilantes. Right. What is gonna enable them to, to flex their muscles this time? Well, I am old enough. I'm, I'm gonna be 58 in a couple of months. So uh, I am old enough to remember the bond vigilantes. Uh, they've been they've been uh, utterly uh, they're an extinct uh, species right now because central banks have murdered them. They're murderer of central banks murdered markets, bond vigilantes, the middle class. They're murderers of a lot of people, a lot of classes. But there there is some vestiges of bond vigilantes left, and they will start to sell their bonds and short the bond market. Wall Street will start to do that, in my opinion, once they are convinced that the Treasury and Central Bank of the United States has no choice but to do what I just said, pass multiple trillion dollar stimulus package, packages in perpetuity. In other words, inflation is gonna go much higher than even where it was a month ago or where it is right now. So you're talking about well into the double digits, inflation. That's what I think, that's when I think um, that's checkmate for the Central Bank and checkmate for the Treasury. So, you know, you can get away with stimulus packages that are monetized by the central bank when you have deflation and disinflation, and quiescent inflation. But when you have inflation, like we've had in the very recent past, when you have that inflation and then you uh, assent to the notion that you have no choice but to do that action of fiscal and monetary support in perpetuity, that's when the bond vigilantes wake up and say, hey, I'm going to short everything you're not buying in unlimited proportion. So if the Fed says I'm buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, they will just sell and short municipal bonds. And any other fixed income instrument on the planet, they will do. That's my philosophy. That's my plan. That's my belief. Okay. So, Michael, first, we're going to go a bit long here. I hope that's okay with you, but you're such a great guest and you're just giving so much of the material that I've wanted to, to I had hoped to draw out of you here. You're doing it faster than I can keep up. And I know that viewers are having a phenomenal time here. Um, I hope that's okay, but I got a bunch of other practical questions I want to get to you uh, right. here before we wrap up the interview. Um, so, okay. So, uh, you wrote, so, so actually, before I get to, to, the, the 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 coming bond uh, crisis. Um, I I I want to just connect a few dots here. So we've had a number of um, financial experts on this program in recent months. I think that they see things similarly to you. So let me just give a quick really? summary, and then you tell me if I'm putting the right words in your mouth. But they <laughs> see they they see a system that is at uh, an unsustainable at unsustainable heights. Uh, there's just way too much risk that's built up in the system. Way too much okay. excess. Jack, Jack, okay, great. Right? <laughs> um, and they see a uh, high likelihood of a deflationary episode where we see a very substantial uh, market correction. Uh, stock market wise, you know, we've, we've seen the Jeremy Granthams of the world predict at least a 50% uh, crash based upon previous uh, moments in history. Um, we've had a fellow named David Hunter on the program not too long ago who says it could go as high as 80%. Um, I think I've seen in your writings a range between 30 and 80%. So um, hopefully that's maybe another check. And then uh, folks think that the policy response to that episode is going to be epic. It's going to make everything that we've seen so far look like child's play in terms of stimulus. And that is going to be extremely inflationary. And uh, you're going to want to kind of get, you know, exchange your cash for anything tangible that's not nailed down, maybe even if it is nailed down. Um, but just, you know, you, you, you want to try to get out of, out of cash into bonds. bonds. You want to get out of bonds. Mostly. And out of bonds too. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, it sounds like that's a third check. So we got um, uh, excessive instability building up to a crescendo, a deflationary crunch that's going to be quite extreme in terms of death, depth and violence. 
uh, and then a uh, just over uh, exuberant policymaker response that's going to create massive inflation and huge devaluation of the currency. Uh, are those more or less correct words to put in your well, mouth? I, I, not only are they correct, I have to say a compliment to you because you say those guests came on your show. So I watched Bloomberg, I watched CNBC, um, and I would say 90 something percent of the deep state of Wall Street's mouthpiece has come up and tell you how they believe inflation is not transitory and they believe that the economy has healed and we are on a very steady trajectory of growth and inflation that's both headed higher. So compliments to you for having people on that have a more informed and, and may I say so far correct opinion that investing, if you were invested for inflation, if you were invested for inflation hedges, which means you were short bonds and long financials and long cyclical stocks and industrial stocks, you have gotten hammered. For instance, like if you own Freeport McMoran at $44 a share and it went to 33, you had a very miserable last few weeks yeah. of your investing life. So you've, you've done a very good service to your viewers. So I hope everybody spreads the, world, the word to watch your program because you're getting alternative views based, based on math and data rather than just um, you know, opinions and feelings that don't matter. Um, well, well, th I, thank I, you very I, much. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And, and you put your finger right on it, which is we're not bringing people on because they share a certain dogma or whatnot. We're really just bringing people on that are critical thinking in their analysis and have you know, empirical arguments to back it up. And I'm happy to bring on somebody who wants to make the bull case as long as they've got data to support it and whatnot. But, but I think to your point, Michael, I think the more critically thinking an analyst is, they, they tend to be coming to a lot of the same conclusions that, that you are. Okay, so, so where I wanna go here is into the bond market because I think everybody sort of feels like they understand the stock market to a certain extent. Um, and um, they understand what a stock market crash looks like. A lot of people don't really understand the, the, the mechanics of, of the bond market. And um, I don't necessarily want you to give a primer on the bond market here. But first off, it's bigger than the stock market. Um, it tends to be more correct than the stock more, market. More words, intelligent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when bonds and, and stocks are diverging in terms of the messages yeah. that they're sending about the future of the economy, the bond market tends to be more often right. So um, I, I guess where I'm going this is... is uh, you wrote your book, The Coming Bond Market Collapse. Um, it seems like you still feel that the bond market does have some really rough days ahead of it. Can you explain succinctly why? You know, is, is it because you're expecting the high inflation of the, the policymakers' results and, and higher rates lead to lower bond prices? Uh, or is there more to it than that? And, and I, I do just want to okay, list a couple of quick things for you to opine on. You know, one is- As succinctly as I can. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Well, well, just real quick. So margin debt is the highest it's ever been. You briefly mentioned it earlier, like $800 billion, right? So just a huge sign of speculation in the bond market system. Uh, junk bonds are trading now at a rate lower than the current rate of inflation, right? Which is ridiculous. I mean, the lowest rates they've ever traded at, um, they're trading what historically might have been an almost like, you know, almost treasury rates. But I mean, right now, they're not even beating the rate of inflation. Um, and uh, total debt now, public and private, is now over $80 trillion. That's over 380% of GDP. We've never been anywhere near that. No country, well, we've never been anywhere near that in our country's existence. Um, can we even kind of normalize that debt burden, or are we just going to collapse under that in general? So I gave you a bunch of things to respond to, but if you can succinctly say, here's why you think the bond market's going to, going to implode or whatever. Uh, so so every, in each and every instance of a crisis since 1987, the Fed was able to rescue and the Treasury was ever able to uh, uh, ameliorate the crisis by printing money, borrowing and printing money and throwing it at the economy and throwing it at Wall Street. And they were able to get away with that because there was no inflation. There was the rate of change of inflation was quiescent. Um, then you, we could argue that you know, the way they measure it, again, let me just stipulate it, the way they measure it. I believe inflation is much higher than the way they measure it, but the way they measure it was, you know, around 2%, trend growth, 2%. This is the first time in history where we're going to have a crisis when the rate of inflation is going to be way above 2%. So that obviates and precludes them from, the, from having the philosophy of they can just save everything by inflation. 
You cannot cure an inflation crisis by creating more inflation. What are the two most important things that are determinant as to what bond yield should be? One is a solvency concern. How, how solvent is the underwriter? Right. How likely am I to be to get? So how likely am I, is my principal going to be paid back? Well, you mentioned the statistic that I just wrote about. We, we now have 80 trillion total public and private debt. That's 380% of GDP, correct. The only time we were anywhere near that was at the nadir of the Great Recession in 2007. Just for a little moment of time, we went to 370% of GDP because GDP absolutely collapsed and the debt is more sticky. But it, safe to say, 380% of GDP, we've never been anywhere near this ratio. So the solvency of our of the U.S. financial system has never been more in question. Not just not just Treasuries. You mentioned junk bonds. I mean, junk junk bonds trade with a three handle now, Adam. That's three hundred basis points below where Treasury should be and where the Fed funds rate should be. <laughs> what a crazy They're world! Tightest, it's the tightest spread to Treasury we have ever seen, and the nominal rate is the lowest it's ever been, and real the real rate is even lower. So you can't. So that's, that's the solvency issue. So that, that's pushing yields higher. Then you add to that, what's the dynamic between in inflation and deflation? Where are you? Well, if you, if you assent to the idea that you have to perpetually now uh, adopt helicopter money, so you're gonna be giving out universal basic income that's not gonna be taxed, it's not even going to be borrowed. It's going to be borrowed from the Federal Reserve. It's not going to be borrowed from the underlying economy. It's going to be borrowed from the Federal Reserve. As a matter of fact, it's not even going to be borrowed from them. It'll be permanently, everybody knows. We tried draining the balance sheet a few years ago in 2018, and it didn't work out the way they claim. Remember, it was supposed to be like watching paint dry in the background? Remember, Jack? Yeah, uh, I remember the yeah, tape for tantrum tape and I never, reversal. I never thought watching paint dry was going to be so exciting because the repo market froze and Russell 2000 dropped 30% in three weeks. That's more exciting than watching paint dry. Yeah, it's like painting with okay. nitroglycerin. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I don't believe they can ever drain the balance sheet. No one believes they'll ever drain. I don't even think they'll even attempt to drain the balance sheet. We are permanently monetizing this debt, highly inflationary. We've already proved how to, I, I told people, for many years, why inflation was going to be sequestered on the canyons of Wall Street because we were not going through the bank. We were not going around the banking system. We weren't circumventing the banking system. We were just handing them money. We stopped doing that. We stopped. We, for the first time in the history of the United States, we actually handed money directly to people in the tune of trillions of dollars. That's for the first time we ever tried handing out trillions of dollars. We got rapid inflation. Everybody will now know. Even, you know, not only just me, everybody's going to know at the, at, the, at the in the wake of the next crisis that we're going to have inflation that's going to pop your eyes out. So that, that means we're going to have an insolvent country that has intractable inflation, and that means yields have to go much higher. End of the story. Great. And those higher yields are just what's going to torpedo the bond bubble is what you're saying. Well, you know, you could have Paul Volcker took yields to 20% in 1981. But, you know, our national debt was like 35% of GDP. Right. <laughs> and, and, co and companies were not nearly as leveraged back then exactly. as they are today. What do you think would happen to the economy and the stock market if we took interest rates to like, you know, forget about 20. How about 10 or, or God forbid, five? You know, well, the, it, the economy you know, would stop and the stock market would crater, right? <laughs> real estate prices would crater and stock market would crater. You'd have a depression. And you said it so beautifully before. And I've written about it many, many times. You've, you've crossed the Rubicon many, many miles over the Rubicon. Returning to normal now would mean that we would have a depression such as we could only imagine. I mean, it'd be, it'd be difficult to even imagine having a depression as deep and as horrible as what we would have if we returned to normal. So we're, we're living in a fantasy world. We're, we're predicated on central bank monetizing of debt. They got away with it up until recently. They started creating runaway inflation. And now that's it. They have no, there's, there's no more games to be played because the next recession, depression, credit crisis, stock market debacle will be extremely deflationary for a while. And then on the wake of that will be inflation that'll just 
absolutely mind-boggling, the rates of inflation that will occur. It won't be hyperinflation traditionally because you need to have a currency crisis. And I don't think the dollar is going to lose ground against the euro or the yen the way like, you know, like say Argentina or Zimbabwe did. But you can very easily get inflation in the hundreds, multiple hundreds of percentage points. Let's see what bond yields do in that uh, environment. That's the big fear. But, but even if I'm completely wrong about everything I just said, what about your investments? Do you want to go long bonds in an environment where the, where it, the benchmark treasury is going from 1.3% to 10? No, you don't. Right. No. You so, be, okay. so that's the key. What, what asset classes, what's, what style factors, what sectors do you want to own? Even if I'm wrong about the direction of, even if I'm wrong about the level of inflation, it's the direction that matters most. More. Right. And, and that is exactly where I want to dive into here. So I'm going to, going to try to land this plane so I don't keep you on here for hours, though I would love to. And I suspect a lot of our viewers would too. And, and really, Michael, um, you know, I, I really respect what you said earlier at the beginning of the interview where you said, look, you know, you, um, you're, you're, you're willing to, you, you prioritize what needs to be done to protect and preserve and hopefully grow wealth, right? So if you have a long-term bullish outlook on a, on a certain asset class, but you don't think it's going to perform well in the short term, you will not own it any longer, right? And you used gold as a good example there. One of the things that's, that, that's, why, we're, that's why we're doing these, this series of interviews is to help people basically track what's happening here in real time, because one of the things that's so unfair, I think, for, for the populace, but average investors right now, is there's no way to safely sit out this game if you don't like the game that's being played, right? There's nowhere you can just park in safety um, if you hate all the madness, right? And so you, you're being forced to have to pay attention. And a strategy that works well for disinflation may not work well at all for deflation and certainly won't work well at all for inflation, right? So you've got to be either paying attention yourself, which to be honest, a lot of people don't have the financial chops to really do well, but they also just have lives to live and they don't have the bandwidth to do it, right? So if they can't do it themselves, they've got to partner with somebody who is doing this full time, right? You, you can't afford to not do this, I guess is what I'm saying, because the Correct. way in the game is structured, you are going to lose if you pick a set it and forget it course because at some point there's going to be part of the trajectory that's going to be toxic to where you, you're positioned. So, all right, as we go through here, um, you've said we're likely to see disinflation for a period of time punctuated at some point by a deflationary event with a crazy inflationary policy response to it. I've seen in some of your recent writing, you've said you don't expect a deflationary episode to happen this year. Like it's not something that you see as as imminent, although of course nobody's got a crystal ball, but it seems like you're, you would say position for disinflation in the near term, be ready to switch to a deflationary environment. And then of course, be ready to come out of that position for inflation. So if I've, if I tell me if I've summarized your position correctly, and if I have, how would you suggest people position today for the deflationary episode that we're in? Well, I wouldn't, well, first of all, you said it correctly. I would not position for def deflation today because we're in disinflation. It's totally different things. Remember I said the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I mean, I am long the dollar. I'm on the first, I'm on, I think I was the only money manager on Wall Street that was long the dollar since March and actually ma you know, making money buying that, um, that ETF UUP that goes up when the dollar goes up. Um, so uh, you wouldn't want to own, you wouldn't want to own um, short, you, I guess you could own short-term treasuries but you wouldn't want to be short the market yet. And you don't want to have high levels of cash yet, which dovetails to my response. You know, you can't just say also, I'm going to sit this one out. I am not going to invest at all. I hate Wall Street. It's all rigged. I'm going to put my money in the bank. Well, putting your money in the bank gets you nothing. I mean, if your money is in the bank, you're losing your purchasing power, depending on how you sure. measure inflation. You know, five, it's a negative six, seven, rates. Yeah. Per annum, you're a guaranteed loser. So They've made you, they've pushed you out along the risk curve, they being the, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, pushed you out along the, the risk curve. You cannot just sit laying fallow in the banking system saying, hey, you know, I, I don't want to take the chance. That's why I created the IDEX strategy. So you can hopefully invest and ride up bull markets more safely, but also protect and profit from bear markets. But you did say it's succinctly correct. But I would not 
invest for deflation yet. I'd wait for my model to say it's coming. First of all, Adam, the Fed hasn't even set a date to start tapering. Right. They just, they, first, they weren't talking about it. Now they said, oh, you know, we're going to talk about it. I think the, the market fell like 3% in the, in the next couple of days, just because they admitted that they're talking about tapering. So I want to wait for the taper to start. I want to see some of these high frequency uh, model indicators start to get jittery and flash yellow and red. And then I'll know when it's time to say, okay, I'm going to sell some of my other bond proxies that won't do well. You don't, by the way, the correlation of everything, the R squared correlation goes to almost one during a deflationary crisis. So, right. You know, you can say, well, you know, um, I, I, I did very well on utilities and disinflation, but I'm going to hold them in deflation. No. You can't. Everything is going to get dumped. Microsoft is going to get dumped. Tech stocks are going to get dumped. Cyclical stocks are going to get dumped along, dumped along with banking and um, um, you know telecom stocks. Everything seems to go down when the correlation goes to one, which always happens in a deflationary environment. So the answer is don't do deflation yet. Do disinflation, which means bond and bond proxies. So staples, uh, utilities, things that prosper, tend to prosper in a disinflationary environment. Low beta stocks, minimum volatility stocks. But stocks, yes, still. I didn't sell anything in Monday's decline. I actually was buying things on Monday's decline because right now we're not seeing any problem in the credit markets. The credit markets are the, in the vanguard of the warning system. I have the model that monitors them. When they start going crazy, when they start getting um, out of line, that's when you have to head for a deflationary posture. Okay, great. And that is exactly what I was hoping uh, you would go uh, enumerate for us. So thanks. I got uh, for disinflation, uh, bonds and bond proxies, uh, utilities, staples, low beta stocks, low volatility stocks. I do want to ask you about one asset you didn't mention, which was gold. And I mentioned that because you, you mentioned earlier that you had sold it, you were beginning to buy it back. I also read a recent piece of yours where you said that gold is, quote, seeing the incipient beginnings of a massive bull market. Um, so as you look to the, the trajectory that we laid out there, so to, how, how do you expect gold to fare sort of in each stage? So gold, by the way, you know, people say it's a hedge against inflation. It's a hedge primarily against falling real interest rates. So if nominal rates are falling, but they're falling faster than the rate of inflation is falling, then you're going to get falling real interest rates. And guess what? That's a wonderful environment to own gold. So I will be adding to gold throughout the remainder of 2022. Gold's going to do very well up until up and until that moment of deflation, which is a liquidity crisis. Then you'll see sh the shadow banking system is going to dump everything that they can possibly dump. And that includes gold. If you look at 2008 or even an early part of 2020, gold did not do well because it's a deflationary liquidity crisis. So up until from now, until the liquidity crisis becomes manifest, I believe in that gold will do very, very well. But when it's really, really gonna do well is on the other side of that liquidity crisis, when we have intractable inflation. And that's when I think people will be piling to gold for a massive run to record highs. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Very specific answer. And, and just to reiterate, to make sure I got it, um, I think gold's going to do very well. We'll have sort of a tailwind with these negative real rates through disinflation. Um, ideally, you either don't want to be holding it or you want to have hedges in place or something once the deflationary episode comes. And then you want to be really long it afterwards because uh, it's going to probably fulfill the vision that most people who are buying, you know, have been buying gold for years have had for it in the long run where it's it's going to be one of those things that's going to protect me from the, the collapse of the currency, basically. So think about think about in the wake of the next depression, re recession, whatever, uh, liquidity crisis, is the Fed's going to be pushing down nominal treasuries, buying bonds, trying to push them as low as possible, even though they will be rising, but they'll be rising slower than inflation. So real interest rates will be falling, which is rocket fuel for gold, for gold. Especially, in a, especially in an environment where you know the Fed and the Treasury have no other choice but to do exactly what I just said. Got it. Okay. And then last question on gold. Um, do you make any differentiation as an investor in, in investing for what we just talked about between owning the metal itself versus the mining stocks? Yeah, yeah, I do. So uh, my, mining shares are shares. So they're, they're stocks. 
they tend to be uh, an exponential uh, reflection on the underlying, underlying commodity. So they'll do better in a gold bull market and they'll do a lot worse in a bear market. So as we head towards disinflation, I expect gold shares to do better than the underlying metal. And then as we head towards the deflationary collapse, then they will get hurt. They will be dumped with every other stock. So, uh, so thank you so much. And so for folks that want to uh, learn more about you and your work, perhaps follow you, where should they go? Pentoport.com. That's the website. You can email me directly at mpento at pentoport.com. You can call the office at 732-772-9500. And uh, you can see the, the web address on the, on the billboard behind me. So we won't, we won't bite. Um, just a phenomenal interview guest. Michael, really, really had fun. Um, thanks so much for coming on and educating us. And again, I look forward to having you on the program later on this year. Completely my pleasure, Adam. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. All right. And gosh, just another great interview. Um, as we do every week, I'm now going to talk with the lead partners at New Harbor Financial about what the markets have done since last week. Um, Mike and John, uh, I'd love to hear your guys' reaction to, to Michael there. Um, gosh, such a great interview. A lot of times I feel like I really have to tease out specifics from our guest experts. Michael was offering so many of them so fast and furiously I could hardly keep up. Uh, but a lot of what he said seems very copacetic, I think, with your approach at New Harbor. John, why don't we start with you? Um, general reaction to Michael's comments. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Adam. Um, you, you can tell a, a, an analyst, a, a commentator that, that thinks deeply and, and thoroughly about the markets and the economy by how easily and how, um, you know, kind of uh, broadly they can bring up uh, points uh, to, to really convincingly uh, paint a picture. And he, he did a fabulous job. Uh, I, I agree with you there. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we, we hear from Michael again today, many of the, the very kinds of things that we are concerned about and, and as, as reluctant as we are to predict things, uh, certainly market price targets and things like that and timelines with specificity, um, his, his kind of scenario um, you know, analysis, I think aligns very much with uh, you know, maybe a, a best case scenario, more, most likely scenario that, that we see. Um, he talked about you know, the, the Fed and monetary policy and fiscal stimulus kind of running out of its juice a bit. Um, you know, we agree. I think, you know, the, the bazooka was, was shot over the last year in response to COVID like, like never before. Uh, and, and just by way of anecdote, um, just, just recently um, on PBS, a, a, a frontline hour long special aired called The Power of the Fed. I actually watched that with my wife because um, you know, certainly I bring a lot of my work home to her, much of which is, you know, she will met over her head. She really enjoyed, I, well, enjoy is probably not the right word because it's kind of down around scary, um, to be honest. Um, but I think the, the, the program did a very good job at, you know, um, putting a check into an otherwise unchecked sequence of policies over the last uh, decade that have just gotten doubled down and doubled down again. And I, I really think there's starting to be some more uh, uh, pervasive and, and common folk um, you know, head scratching and downright um, anger, maybe even at, at some of the policies that have been undertaken. So I think, yeah, I think we, we're going to see some of these policies, you know, kind of run out of ammo uh, and, you know, have the markets, which have undeniably been, you know, inflated to obscene levels by these policies start to leak. You know, the scenario of, of disinflation uh, to start, we think is, is quite Likely, you know, the recent inflationary spike we think will will, will abate in, in in the face of you know some of these programs running out of steam, and and then we think inevitably there's an, a deflationary kind of episode that <clears throat> ultimately will cause some pain, very very large pain we think in financial markets for sure, probably the broader economy as well. Um, but the only response that policymakers seem to know is one that gets the bazooka out again. So, so yeah, eventually after the deflationary bust, we see a, you know, a, a, an inflationary cycle that probably will be really, really uh, uncontainable for a while. And, and uh, you know, um, some of the things that, that uh, Michael talked about in terms of the kinds of investment strategies and in different uh, um, era or, or scenarios of inflation, disinflation, deflation. Yeah, those are very much textbook um, and we agree with them and, you know, we certainly reiterate those here uh, in, our, in our spot, but I'll, I'll pause there and, uh, you know, uh, see if Mike has anything to add or, or certainly uh, I'm sure you got more 
thought joggers for us, Adam, that we can comment on. Sure. Yeah. And Mike, I'll, I'll go to you in just a second, but I, I do want to build on a couple of things that John just mentioned there. Um, one was one of the things I really like about um, this whole video series that we've been engaged in over the past bunch of months is we're talking to you know different experts who have different methodologies and how they come to their their outlooks uh, on the market um, and when they use different methodologies but come to the same conclusions uh, that really makes me feel whenever they do that that those conclusions are probably much more probable uh, because you know many roads are still leading to the same place and um, you know John you just said Michael's outlook you know more or less aligns with your guys's but it also aligns with that of uh, you know Grant Williams and Stephanie Pomboy and David Hunter and Axel Merck and and just you know so many on and on you know Luke Roman Jesse Felder uh, so many of the people that we've brought on this program they all have their little piece of the puzzle but I think we are if we sort of average out everybody's um, outlooks they they do seem to be describing this sort of remaining period of short term disinflation maybe we get some market highs out of that but at some point. There's going to be a break. We have that really painful, violent deflationary period, which will likely not last terribly long as the policymakers just go full bore doing whatever they can to try to reinflate the system. So no guarantees about what's going to happen in the future. But I just want to underscore for viewers here that we are hearing this general arc repeated again and again by the different experts that we bring on this program. Um, and Mike, going over to you, you know, John talked about, um, you know, how Michael was was predicting that, you know, a lot of the monetary and fiscal stimulus that's been flushed into the system over the past year and a half is going to be abating. And, you know, the market really isn't ready for that. I mean, just, it, it's, it's so dependent on that stimulus now that I don't think the market really has uh, really believes that it's going to end yet. And so if it does, uh, that could really trigger some some big downside surprises in the market. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've been witnessing euphoria like we've never seen before in so many different ways to measure sentiment and um, excessive risk taking from margin debt that's off the charts high to cash held by mutual funds at all time lows to investors, uh, investor, uh, advisor, investor intelligence readings. I mean, it just goes on and on. And, and this one just seems relentless. Every single dip is bought immediately within 24 hours. This week, we saw another example of it. Biggest down day in eight months reversed immediately, essentially, and by the next day. So yeah, we, we've got a market that has doubled, basically, if you look at the S&P off the, the, the March of 2020 lows, it's more than that for the NASDAQ. You know, and we've got, we've, got, we've got everything opening back up. I've been traveling this week um, and every single seat in every single plane I've taken, I've taken several has been absolutely full. Everything's open, optimism abounds. People think the worst is behind us and the worst probably is behind us as far as the pandemic is concerned but all of that is already baked in the cake you know what i mean we just had the biggest stimulus since world war ii essentially spent six i think it's uh, i think it was almost six trillion dollars total uh, in pandemic relief it's it's the biggest even inflation adjusted stimulus since world war ii in terms of government spending government deficit spending all of that has resulted in a market that's you know, trading at, at, at ridiculous multiples, uh, stock market capitalization to GDP of over 200%, never ever before been seen. And we've been seeing a divergence in participation. A handful of stocks are pull, pushing this market higher while the average stock has been going down. And so it's, ju it's just, it's a very, very dangerous environment. Everybody knows it's a bubble. Everyone on the road I've been traveling, uh, uh, as I said, and talking to knows it's a bubble. Um, and, and still yet nobody really wants to do anything about it because, you know, a, a bubble is hypnotizing and um, there's nothing to talk about anymore in terms of the bullish arguments, really, other than the Fed. The Fed's not going to let it go down. This ubiquitous belief that, you know, we're in an unsinkable situation. You know, we know how that usually ends. It's not it's not very well. And so, yes, it's getting tiring to say the same story uh, week after week and month after month. But. Um, we don't see any reason to do anything different. In fact, we're getting more alarmed as, as time goes on. 
All right. Well, thanks, Mike. And, and you said, mentioned a couple important things there. Um, you know, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, he's seeing peak optimism everywhere. And it sounds like, you know, you're still seeing that everywhere you travel with everyone you talk to. Um, I've actually just released a video that you guys haven't had a chance to see it because you're on the road. But, but a new risk that I talk about in that video is the, res the potential resurgence of COVID with this Delta variant. Um, it is spreading so rapidly right now, and uh, it, uh, you know, it, 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 they're, they're saying that it, it's looking like it's going to be a really serious fourth wave of the virus that will find the unvaccinated population and infect it. And um, the, the, I'm not saying that is for sure going to happen, but the, the risk that it could happen, and again, um, even if it's not as fatal, if it overwhelms the hospital system with sick people in beds, you then see increase in fatality rates as everybody else who's got serious medical conditions can't get adequate care in the hospitals, right? And that would then force us back into business slowdowns or business sh shutdowns, undoing all this opening up that you're talking about that you're seeing everywhere, right? And, and, and I just bring it up to say that is yet another potential major risk that the market is in no way, shape or form pricing in at all right now. So they're not pricing in the potential reduction in the, the monetary and fiscal stimulus, and they're not pricing in the potential of a Delta variant uh, ripple through the population. So um, it, it seems like it is a dangerous peak optimism everywhere right now. Um, so real quick, as we, uh, as we wind down here, I know we don't have a ton of time since you guys are on the road. Um, Mike, you mentioned that you guys haven't made too many changes in the portfolio. Um, if you could just talk about uh, the precious metals, I know they've still been a bit weak since last week. Uh, you guys making any changes based on that, uh, or are you not worried at this point? Well, you know, I, I'd like to say we're not worried, but, you know, in, in the market, there's no guarantee, so we're always worried about something. But at least we can, um, we can manage that worry by use of uh, appropriate hedges. There's tools for that, in other words. And so we do maintain a put position on our gold mining uh, shares. And we, we, you know, frankly, we think that that makes sense. And, um, you know, gold has been a little bit weak, although it's holding in at the $1,800 level. Silver popped down to, or dropped it down to 24 and change, it's back to 25. So we're not worried about gold and silver right now. And it's particularly because the dollar has been relatively strong in the last few days to, to a week. Uh, we're seeing other commodities come off, like John said. I mean, we saw just this, this rocket ship with lumber and it's fallen almost all the way back to the beginning of that parabola. You know, we've seen other commodities come come in too. So, you know, certainly the commodities taking off and screaming inflation seem to have been a little bit premature. So, no, gold holding in here at 1800, not a big concern. It could even drop a little bit more to that major support zone of 1680 to 1720. But, um, you know, right now we don't worry about it too much. And we feel better about the fact that we've got put position uh, on our gold mining share. Right, right. And glad, glad you reiterated the fact that you guys are hedged because that's a, a big part of how you guys recommend um, people invest is that they, they protect their positions with downside hedges just in case the bet goes wrong because not every bet goes the way that you think it will. But yeah, it's good, good that, you know, to remind ourselves that gold and silver are still trading at extremely profitable levels uh, for the, the, the precious metals mining companies and at levels that, you know, two years ago, we could have only fantasized of as long suffering uh, precious metals holders. And of course, Michael said that he thinks gold and silver are gonna do very well during both the disinflationary periods, as well as the inflationary period that, that would follow a deflationary crunch. John, I'm gonna let you have the last word here. As I do, I, I just wanna um, ask if you can re repeat the name of that uh, documentary that you mentioned uh, about the Fed. I think it's really important that we are beginning to see some criticism of the Fed appear in more mainstream sources like that. Um, you know, I think as, as this inflationary, you know, bout that we're going through right now continues to ripple through, it is waking up more and more people who are saying, wait a minute, why is my food all of a sudden costing so much more? Why is gas spike so much? Um, and, you know, not everybody, but more and more of them are connecting the dots that the Fed is playing a role in that. And I think that's really important because the Fed is still seen as the hero by the majority of folks, but we need to get to a shift where people see it really as the perpetrator in this situation. So last word, John. Yeah, yeah. that, that documentary, again, it's a frontline documentary. Uh, so it airs on PBS, but you can also see it online. 
uh, at frontline.org. And if you just search there for the power of the Fed, and Adam, I did send you the link to that. I don't know if you could flash that up. But, but again, I highly recommend it because uh, folks that listen to these videos often hear Mike and I and Adam and, and a lot of your guests, uh, Adam, talk about the Fed as, as you know, more or less a culprit here, um, you know, even though they, they want to come off as saviors and oftentimes do good credit for that. We think it's um, um, improper credit, frankly, because a lot of their policies are the very seedlings and uh, fertilizer that gives rise to these crises that they come and clean up. But the reason I recommend it is it's, it's a very layperson um, grasp, you know, graspable documentary. And there's really authoritative folks on there. There's Sheila Bear, for example, who was an unsung hero in the housing crisis. She headed up the FDIC at the time. And she's one of the very few voices in the room that actually were talking about this being a problem and, and before it was too late. Uh, Jeremy Grantham's in there, Howard Marks, a legendary investor. Um, and there are, are, are also some interviews of some Fed officials that, you know, you'll, you'll get a taste for the dogmatic way of thinking, you know, folks like Neil Kashkari, um, you know, so, so highly recommend it. My wife watched it, as I said, and it helped her connect a lot of the dots that, that I bring home from, from work. Um, Great. All right. Well, folks, go watch that. Uh... After you've watched this video, uh, you know, this long uh, series of, of uh, it, the interview here with Michael uh, Pento, if you've got any remaining energy left, go watch that Frontline documentary that John's talking about. Um, all right, folks, real quickly as we wrap up, um, you know, can't emphasize more than, than ever that uh, this is a time for uh, getting your financial house in order. Um, as always, we recommend working with a professional financial advisor who gets the risks that Michael, John, and I and Mike talk about. Um, if you've already got a good one who can do that, great, stick with them. But if not, uh, the folks here at New Harbor Financial do offer their uh, free, no strings attached consultations. Well, they will listen to your personal financial situation and give you their advice on what they think you should do. They do that largely as a public service. If you wanna take advantage of that, stick around at the end of the video, we tell you how to do that. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please take a second and click on the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. It seems like a really tiny thing, but if all the thousands of folks watching these videos do it together, uh, it boosts our subscriber account, which then gives us the ability to attract even bigger name guests on this program in the future. It's been working great so far, but of course, the bigger we get, the bigger names we can attract. Uh, lastly, if you want to see who's coming on the program, uh, as well as suggest names for it and get a sneak peek at the new Wealthy on background uh, that we'll have in the studio here, just go follow me at, at Menlo Bear on Twitter. And John and Mike, thanks for piping in from the road. Whatever the markets do next from here, we will be tracking it together as we always do every week. And I will see you guys next week. Thank you, Adam. We'll see you next week. Until then, Adam, we'll see you. Have a great one. You guys too. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. 
All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.